And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple, a man from the land of hippity hoppity, get off of my property, Texas. <laughs> a, a man known for his pet, a known a man known for his twenty-sided dice and his pedantry, and eh, and best known as A. a. Ron. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, yep. man? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Good to be here. So, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the hum humble beginnings or the origin story, as some might call it. Um. So with that in mind, how did you how did you first get into tabletop gaming and what made it stick? Well, uh, so it's it's an interesting, I, maybe an interesting story, at least for the the fact that you know I, I tend to play old school stuff now. Uh, but uh, this is often going to get people to break into making uh, you know the the holy doing the holy symbols and things like that. Uh, but Interestingly, what kind of got me into D&D and, and, and tabletop role-playing games at large uh, in a roundabout way is Critical Role. <laughs> uh, you know, the year was 2017. Uh, basically, um, I was freshly divorced-ish. Uh, I was dating a, a beautiful girl who had friends that were uh, gamers, and they felt like there weren't enough women in the group because there were zero and so she was the uh, the diversity hire, and uh, <laughs> so they they invited her, and she said, "Hey, can I bring my boyfriend?" And they said, "Well, I guess." And uh, you know, I'd always been interested in um, the property Dungeons and Dragons. I really didn't know what tabletop gaming actually was. You know, as far as I knew, it was just basically board games with maybe some extra steps. I really had no idea. Um, it's not and inaccurate. It's, yeah, I mean, it's it's not too terribly far off, but at the same time, you know, it's just, it feels wrong to say that. <laughs> but, um, so, basically, the DM that started the whole game was inspired to start playing again because of Critical Role. Uh, so he picked up 5th edition, he got the thing going, uh, and we all played together, and uh, instantly, I, I was hooked. Um, you know, I... So I started with 5th edition, and again, like I said, 2017. So a lot of times I tend to put that at the forefront. So anybody that, you know, falls on my YouTube channel knows that I'm not speaking from the realm of someone who has a great deal of wisdom and experience. For me, it's mostly just, hey, this is something I think is cool kind of thing. Let me let you in on uh, a little trade secret. <laughs> um, you, only have, you only have wisdom and experience next month. <laughs> uh, and I know, I know some. I don't. Um, I don't pass judgment on on pe on people who um, who got their start through Critical Role. Um, I only pa I only pass I only pass judgment on two partic on two particular types. The people who who dis who dismiss it reflexively because that's swinging the pendulum one way. And the people who wa who watched and pretend that they play. Mm, and I yeah. always know that because I, because um, they're the they're the people who will bring up Matt Mercer when trying to question one of my decisions as GM, to the point where. <laughs> and the the best part about this, and I've told this story before, I got so frustrated one di one day when I was running a handful of different games for a week f to celebrate Free RPG Day. I um I talk I I talked with the guy who runs my LG my LGS as I was as I was cooling off because he and I have been friends for years, and I half jokingly said I should put up a, I should put up a Wayne's World style sign that says absolutely no Matt Mercer like the no stairway sign in the in Wayne's World. <laughs> I come back in I come back in about two weeks later and I see that exact sign on the wall. Nice. <laughs> Which, oh, it makes my job easy because now when somebody does that, pulls that on me, I can just point to the sign. Yeah, I'd say that uh, Matt Mercer's had less of an impact on my games in that way than Jeremy Crawford, unfortunately. 
uh, because a lot of times what I what I'd run in most people that I I've played with, even though they're in my age range, uh, I only know like maybe one or two that actually have watched or listened to Critical Role. Most of them just know that it exists, but really don't interact with it in any yeah. other way. Um, but Jeremy Crawford, on the other hand, whenever there is a moment that a player really feels like I've got the wrong interpretation, then they have to go consult Sage advice, and then. That's whenever the, uh, the the misfortune begins. I actually had a player one time uh, tweet at Jeremy Crawford in the middle of a session and because he was, <laughs> he was trying to dispute my ruling. And if if I'm being honest, um, I have a higher opinion of Mercer than I do of Crawford. I not um just be just because just because of some some rather some rather infamous mistakes that he that he's made that I will. Prop, that will probably pick on him for the longest time because I am a because I am a very petty man. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, have, I have a dwarven style book of grudges. <laughs> but, we may actually agree on some of those. Um, one of the, now one particular in one of the more infamous incidents was the was those um psionic subclasses that were put into unearthed arcana. Mm-hmm. That that were just that just had some really dumb moves like like the idea that wi- that um, psionics are wizards who cast spells with their mind. Yeah, <laughs> which um, they back they backpedaled on that real quick. Um, as well as the whole, as well as when it came to when it came to certain when it came to certain um, mecha- when it came to certain mechanics like for like for say hirelings or or holdings and the like or even or even a good or even a good chunk of item creation i think he or one of the other people um at at Wansi had this attitude of we lifted blank so that players could come up with it on their own mm-hmm. which is probably the worst response you could have given if you had just said we wanted we wanted focus on that in a, in a in a later book i'd be like okay that's a bit bullshit but I'll, but i'm willing to go with that it's not the first time that's happened yeah, at least they could honestly say we just want more money later. <laughs> I've um I've seen plenty I've seen plenty. Now I will I will freely admit that the one whipping boy that I have as as an RPG commentator as I've mentioned in past videos is Grogs. The pe- the people who ha- the people who have a over romanticized view of er- of earlier editions or earlier traditions for mm-hmm. this um, this idea of how this idea of how the game is supposed to be played. Mm-hmm. Those I will those kind of people I will regu- I will pick on with a degree of regularity, largely because largely because of the fact that a lot of times they end up revealing how they how they're only familiar with a ha- with a handful of games or play styles. Um, mm-hmm. A infamous moment I've had to, I've had to deal with regarding this this is um when Tome of Power came out in the early two thousands and was very clearly taking some inspirations from th- from things like video games and manga mm-hmm. and for a lot for a lot of grogs that was verboten and my whole my whole thing was. Gygax and Arneson put the stuff that they did in old school D and D, because it because it was stuff that they happen to be fans of, right? And you're going to see that you're going to see that particular motif fo- motif follow with authors to come. Oh. Also, if there's a cert if there's a certain style of fantasy that D and D is supposed to be played at, um, the devs have done a vi- have done a very poor job of showing it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh that that is that yeah, that kind of dissonant feeling that I get um whenever we come to the table, we we've all read the same mechanics in the same uh all the same material if assuming that they did read it and not just like select the the features that they thought sounded cool on D&D Beyond or something like that. But uh and and yet we still, you know, whenever it comes to the moment we're actually playing the game, we have entirely different conceptions of what our characters are capable of uh, and how they came about having those abilities and 
you know, what those translate to in within the context of a world. It's, uh, you know, it can, it can be a little bit baffling. Um, and that's, that's really, you know, it's kind of like how you were saying the, uh, uh, I didn't know that that was an answer that was provided, but uh, that uh, Jeremy Crawford had said that um, the players are are meant to fill in those blanks. Um, you know, I I feel like that's one of my biggest gripes. Perhaps is that there is they they left things so open uh, so that people could fill those blanks and use their imagination and everything. And that's it sounds great on paper, but not so much whenever you're wanting to have people kind of on the same page about you know what. What does what does this mean? What does that mean? You know, what does that look like? Um, and so, you know, we would end up on wildly different pages, and um, yeah, that uh, it, it gets a little frustrating. I got to say, um, that's one thing that I, I am liking about. Um, you know, I, I'm basically right now. I'm primarily playing first edition, uh, and that's one of the things I kind of like about it. Is it it really does. It, it is a little bit more concrete on certain things, even though it's also uh, often contradictory. And you also have to take a lot of things with a grain of salt because you, you don't even know if the, the designer himself believed in using certain mechanics. <laughs> um, well, here's here's where things get tricky, because when dealing with for, when dealing with first edition, the elephant in the room I have to address is which first edition? Because there, because there's like four, because there's like four of them. Oh, uh, AD and D first edition, and really, I have to. I can only talk about before Unearthed Arcana because I haven't. I haven't even read Arth Unearthed Arcana. Mm -hmm. I'm still wrapping my head around first edition AD and D. Yeah. Um, I have I have played uh, second edition AD and D. I I don't know what exactly was going on under the hood. I was just a mere player, just playing a cleric. Um. But uh, yeah, be, beyond that, um, that's that's my experience with AD and D, though. Mm -hmm. um, when it, now, I, I still have my copy of Unearthed Arcana, and um, some of some of the some of the some of the attempts to expand on classes are very much a mixed bag. Um, I know a lot of I know a lot of people talk about how, talk about how the ranger is borked in. Um, fifth edition nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. From my experience, the ranger has had borking problems since day one. <laughs> <laughs> the er the earliest versions of of things like ranger and barbarian were not very good. Um, bard was it was a me was a mess. Um, assa <laughs> assassin is an inf is an infamous bit of what of what the fuckery that even even the designers admit was a bad idea. Mm. Um. If, but the ranger, the ranger one. I'd the big problem with a lot of them is that they were try, is that it was an attempt to try and kit bash existing classes into new ideas. Like the early monk was kind of this weird kit bash of a of a um cleric and a thief. Yeah, I guess I guess I haven't really looked honestly. I really haven't looked at the monk too much. Uh, terrible as it is to say in front of the the gaming monk, um, <laughs> you know, I, I I have a rough understanding of kind of like what they're capable of, but I haven't really looked into the minutia enough to, and I, I haven't looked up the history of, of you know of the monk to see, you know, because like it's not quite like the uh, the other classes to me that are absolutely. Um, I don't know. Like whenever I think D and D, monk is usually the thing that I'm like, eh. <laughs> like not that I not that I hate monks or that they that they don't belong. It's just that I tend to think of the the more premier archetypes. You know, the uh, the fighter, the cleric, the the, the magic user. Uh, well, and you know, we can bring in the we can bring in the thief. That's optional. Uh, I, I'm just I'm just kidding. We'll bring in the thief. <laughs> but uh, you know, but there there are some some purists that never went on after. OD and D before you know certain supplements came out. They're like, yeah, yeah there's just three. <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not that level of I'm not that level of purist because when I see that level of purist, all that I, all that I see is a hipster with a different coat of paint. And <laughs> you ever hear the expression of lipstick on a pig? Yeah, yeah. No, no matter what kind you put on it, it's still a pig. Oh, or. Not to sound a bit, not to sound too Minnesotan, but the way I always looked at it is 
If it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it sure as hell ain't a goose. <laughs> Although, yeah, I you know I I have uh, I mean I haven't I haven't played I haven't played uh, O D and D without uh, without the, uh, the the thief, but you know I can kind of understand where they're coming from as far as the the disappointment that now what we used to just handle through uh, you know just whatever the D the DM feels like is appropriate probability wise or you know description. Now we need to handle through these percentages and, and all that kind of stuff. I can I can kind of understand why people uh, were resentful of it, but at the same time, um, I you know because I started with uh, with having all of these um, possibilities, you know, uh, even the dreaded warlock, um, you know, it, like going backward, um, I I can't really I can't really hate yeah. I can't really hate any of those things. I just feel like everything is. A matter of what what actually what is this what is having this class do to your game and do you like that do you like mm -hmm. the effect that that brings yeah, uh, if and if I'm being if I'm being honest I've I've seen people do the whole, do the whole just have just have the GM deci decide it kind of thing, um, mm -hmm. which certainly makes certainly works to a point but I think so, I think some games and some designers rely a little too much on that and you're putting extra work on somebody who's already going to be overworked as it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, I could, I could see that. I feel like I would have been a lot less, a lot less keen to do that, especially whenever I first started uh, running games. Um, you know, because uh, basically I started with fifth edition, which you know has a very, it has kind of a, a way that you can wrap almost any kind of situation into skill checks or, or you know ability checks or um, you know there, there's something you can you can kind of find a way to resolve things uh but whenever i went back to bx um then there were all of these gaps that i'd never had to think about before but fortunately you know i had seen by that point well whenever i was playing dungeon crawl classics you know we had this kind of situation and i could do this uh and then whenever i would factor in like uh lords of olympus it's like well this is what i would do whenever you'd have people of roughly comparable strength and whatever without without needing to you know do roles if you know just like drawing on what i had learned from uh running systems you know um i feel like whenever you have that uh that that more more experience i feel like it, it makes it a little bit uh a little bit easier but then again at the same time i can understand why people would find that um undesirable because then everything is entirely in the uh you know the d if the dm is being partial then at that point they're, they're just kind of giving you stuff you know they're giving you victories or defeats at their whim yeah there's no oh um, i don't i think i ultimately think it should it's something that should vary from table to table the only um the only time i take issue is when is when the argument is made that one approach is somehow better when it when it really isn't um but going to, going back to some of the weirdness with some of the expanded classes one of the bit one of the big ones that it that was a case of um a a, a a a disappointment or just a head scratcher is the barbarian mhm mm <laughs> what with the what with the whole you have to destroy mat you have to destroy magic <laughs> items and you can't <laughs> And by the time you get to 11th level, hooray, you can finally use magic items. The players have been <laughs> using magic items since day one. Oh. Yeah, I, I've, got, I've got no freaking clue. <laughs> what it, like, okay, I, I can understand thematically why you would want to do something in that ballpark. You know, the whole idea that barbarians are superstitious and they, they don't trust magic. And, like, I can understand wanting to lean into that in some capacity. But, um, you know... Really, I, I think it makes sense maybe in the context of the kind of game that you could run where, you know, we have that understanding that uh, apparently they would run uh, multiple groups of, you know, all kinds of different player characters. And so you might band this one with that one in this, you know, endeavor. And so then it might be the case where you're just like, well, I have this barbarian mm -hmm. and I just need to be sure that whenever I'm playing with this guy who's a magic user, I don't bring him. I bring my other character instead. Um, and then it makes a little bit more sense. But even then, it's still kind of 
like for everybody else who's just maybe playing once a week with the same group every time it's just a pain in the ass you're just like well we gotta hand wave it <laughs> if i'm being honest i always hand wave those um enforced behavior rules that certain classes had at had back then and to a lesser extent now mm -hmm. um that one that one is that one is a relatively easy target for this for this kind of thing because they because they have to but I'm, but also some of the morality questions that come up regarding a regarding alignment um a lot yeah. of times I don't even I don't even use a I don't even use alignment at least not in that at least not in that sense yeah um, yeah the I'm... of course the infamous one is the whole is the that guy problem that can happen whenever you have a paladin because Paladins have a rules mandated reason to be a dick. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm playing with that right now. Like I have a in my first edition game, we have a lawful good paladin, and he is often, you know, keeping keeping an eye on the rest of the party. But we benefit from the fact that we are running two different groups. And I basically said, okay, we have somebody who has the ability to play a paladin. He wants to play a paladin. Let's split into two groups. We'll have one group that is primarily lawful good. And then we'll have the other group, which is basically everybody else. So even the thief in that uh, that group with the paladin is neutral good, mm -hmm. which I don't, I don't even remember if that's actually um, supposed to be that way. But um, you know, it just just so happens that if they're wanting to get something done with that without the the paladin, you know, being privy to it, that's probably going to be a downtime thing. Um, um, I don't have any proof of this, but it's speculated that. The reason the at death's door rule was added was added in later editions was because of because of how many times rangers would keep get, would keep getting killed. Mm. <laughs> oh. Especially get especially given how arm um the, because of how AC worked armor was a is a much bigger deal in those in those earlier editions and rangers oh, yeah. Um, aren't going to be good. Aren't going to be able to deal with the heavier armor that f that um f that fighters can have. <clears throat> and one one would think one would think, well, just ha just have them stay just have them stay back and pick off. That's that's a bandage, <laughs> not not quite not quite an answer to the problem. Yeah, and I feel like that kind of um that that kind of goes into something that I. I... I'm not really big in like one of the things that I, I think is really useful, at least for my purposes, is to enforce those rules about firing into a melee. So, I mean, if you have a, a ranger who's wanting to to hang back, you know, it's uh, it's going to cause some problems. And plus, you know, one of the things that's kind of neat about the ranger is, you know, they have that increased uh, chance of surprise and the, the lessened, um, you know, occurrence that they're surprised. So it kind of makes them ideal for. Uh, picking off, um, you know, small groups, you know, they can, I've had a lot of incidents where because of the fact that the ranger got a pretty significant surprise, he's able to pop off like six arrow shots before not, I, well, actually, no, it'd be even more than that, uh, because first edition surprise is absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then run away, you know, basically take out a few enemies, run away, and yeah. then uh, re-engage uh, with everybody there. I will admit I look at that kind of thing as being a bit um D a bit DM dependent. Mhm. Mm it's this much like it much like with how in later editions you have the whole favored enemy and favored terrain kind of mechanics. Um which I under I understand narratively what it what it's trying to what it's trying to do. The problem is is that in or it means that in order for for that particular character to be to be able to contribute, they have to ha they have to have encounters or, or terrain types built around them. And well, in the, in the case of the ranger, the one of the other big problems is one anything that they can do, a druid can do, and and more. <laughs> Fair. And two, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to justify. A character archetype that's all about being outdoorsy when most dungeons are not outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
That is true. It, it kind of uh, it, it eases the wound a little bit, though. Uh, in I mean, I don't know exactly what this looks like in second or third or even or, or fourth because you know I haven't I haven't uh, haven't done the well I haven't played a ranger in second I, I don't even do they have a ranger I'm sure they do they did um, and one of the, one of the things with one of the things with rangers in se- in second that I've gotten into a lot of arguments about is it never made s- the f- rangers could cast spells but they cast they cast spells from the same from the same spell list that druids would and this kind of contributes to that problem of why would I do why would I do that when I can just be a druid get get wild shape and be able to co- be able to cover in combat and in casting mhm yeah uh the thing that kind of makes that a little bit more uh tolerable I guess is you know with first first edition the the ranger is almost just like pure upside if you aren't thinking about all the uh, restrictions that you have like socially uh you know it's I can't like even the uh, the whole uh, fighter go chop through a million one hit die creatures is still supposed to apply to 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 the paladin and the the ranger from what I understand. Mm, it, it there's too many moving parts to to say. Is that there are as I mentioned before there's multiple ver- there's multiple versions of first edition and each of them has their own little quirks. Right. Um, sometimes, depending on who was editing the book, and then there's significant difference between BX and um, Beckme, as they're, as they're called. Oh, yeah, yeah. I- I'm just talking about the Gary Gygax Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition. Mm-hmm. And I'd say, an- I'd say another um, culprit of, the- of that whole thing of a-, of a archetype that doesn't really work in Dungeons... That was in Unearthed Arcana was the Cavalier. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. How do I get my horse down the stairs? <laughs> I, rem- I remember my father telling me a sto- telling me a story about how his how one of it one of his brothers had done as a senior prank, um, put a managed to sneak a managed to sneak a cow into the school, and they had to get a crane <laughs> to get the thing out because cows don't walk downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Which that's it. It certainly works for a senior prank. Um, a little overkill, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing, but those those sort of archetypes. It's it was almost. I can under I can understand the intent, but the the problem is. Even back then, the, I'd say the vast majority of modules and adventures that people would be playing, and thus would would um, serve as the foundation for when they start doing their own stuff, were going to be dungeons. Right. That's been that's been, that's been a thing ever ever since Blackmore and Greyhawk. And the pro- the problem is if you're go- if you're going to do that, it's best not to have um, character best not to have character archetypes that require certain environments yeah yeah definitely because if obviously if you're obviously if you're not going in a dungeon hat bringing bring along a ranger or a cavalier can certainly have its benefits but once again that goes back to that whole this thing is useless unless the g unless the gm builds around it mm-hmm. which I don't know about you, but I've but I've um, whenever I've built encounters, I've always I've always built them in an all in an all purpose manner, not spe- not specifically for what the what party I'm going to ha- I'm going to have at that moment because a lot of times I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Whenever I first started playing, you know, the uh, culture that I was kind of uh, inducted in was basically you you create the encounter with the party specifically in mind you know because you want to you want to offer a, a balanced encounter that's going to challenge them but still be you know uh defeatable and uh if you have certain weaknesses uh, that the players have the player characters have that you can exploit in order to you know increase the uh, the tension then uh that's a it's a good thing to employ and all that kind of stuff and my um my perspective on that is shifted dramatically uh, assume, because of the style of game that I play now. I'm not saying that it's not, um, you know, 
like don't ever do that. I'm not saying anything like that, but just for my purposes, it tends to be uh, better for me to just, you know, create the world and then let them go nuts. And, uh, you know, so if they, if they go through something that, that they just plow right through, then there's a pretty good chance that the reward that they get from it is not going to be worth the time as much as if they would have done something a lot more challenging. And that's really the only, uh, the only um, yardstick that I, I, I'm able to use for that uh, too terribly well these days. Mm-hmm. Now, I, w- I, will ad- I will admit that um, I know a lot of people really don't like Thaco. Um, mm. I've always looked at Thaco as a good idea that was poorly, that was poorly elaborated on. Mm-hmm. Because I, th- I, th- I think that I think that if you, I think that if you wrote it at if you wrote it as this is the default number minus ar- minus armor that's what you're sh- that's what you're rolling under. Um, I think a pe- I think people would have an easier time understanding it. I'd say what doesn't help matters is the lack of unification when it comes to what sort of die roll you're going to be doing. Mhm. You know, some you know, when doing checks you're try when doing checks you're trying to roll high, when doing attacks you're trying to roll low, when that kind of thing. Yeah, it's uh it, it is it is a little <laughs> it can be a little bit weird, but at the same time, I I, I don't know, I, I like I like the a lot of the different resolutions, you know, whenever I'm playing uh, BX. It's just kind of it's kind of fun that you know, like uh, if we're if we're doing something that there's not really a rule for, but it falls under this particular uh, ability score, then you know we can roll under that, and you know that that's uh, usually going to give you somewhere between like a I don't know a fifteen to ninety five percent chance, you know, and uh, that's uh, um, not not ninety five. I guess it'd be ninety. I remember. A while, a while back, I had James Ward on, who's done a lot of done a lot of stuff in the early days of TSR, mm-hmm. and I remember him talking about how with that um with AD and D first between AD, between second they they wanted to shift the language level from a um, college level to more of a high school level, mm-hmm. which. I think contributed to what to why I see why I see so much of an impact with um, second edition among a lot of people, as a, as opposed to AD and D first. Mm-hmm. And of course, trying to trying to sm- trying to smooth out some of those bits of weird that I talked about. I didn't even get to psionics, which they, <laughs> every everybody at every former TSR person I've talked to has said. Yeah, we tried to get it to work, but it didn't take. <laughs> now, is that in reference to the original or the uh, the uh, second edition Psionics? All of them, or just all of them, all of them. <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't looked at the second edition Psionics, but uh, the first edition uh, Psionics. I mean, it should tell you enough just knowing that that if you look at what Gary Gygax said, he says, "Yeah, I didn't use that shit." <laughs> so, like that's. Uh, that's to me clear enough that um, you know, if 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 the designer of the system themselves like they if they don't believe in the mechanic that they've created or at least they they don't use it you know then uh, I, I can't really have any uh, desire to try and remain you know um, fixed on it. So there there are quite a few things that fall by the wayside with that you know um, weapon versus armor type is something that you know he said he didn't use. Uh, what was another one? I think weapon length was another one. Um, there, there are quite a few. Yeah, some something that something that I think is is import is important to bear in mind is the is the environment that D and D was born out of. Mm-hmm. The the fact that um, both Gygax and Arneson were ch- were children of the war gaming the war gaming scene and more specifically the historical wargaming scene of, scene of the 70s. Right. Where Avalon Hill was ba- was basically the basically the um big man on campus so to speak. 
and yeah, that is. Oh, go ahead. And um, a lot. Well, with um, with Ar- with Arneson, a lot, a lot of er- a lot of the early ideas could probably stem back to the Napoleonic campaign that he that he would play bef- um, in mi- in the early days in Minnesota. Hmm. Oh, but I always I always find it funny when I when people talk up a storm as if um, Gygax and Arneson had some had some grand design plan on how on how they were going to do things. They didn't. Yeah, it <laughs> a lot doesn't it look just like that them, at all. A lot of it is just them flying by the seat of their pants. Yep, and uh, yeah, the the one of the things that I I, I saw that was really interesting was. Uh, that uh, from what it seemed like, uh, the armor class, if you want to call it that, in Chainmail was actually ascending. And then whenever they created uh, the the alternate combat rules, they they flipped it because uh, they thought that would be easier. <laughs> but uh, that two d six roll that you were supposed to do in uh, in Chainmail, if I read the chart correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, the plate mail is going to be like uh, up there at the top where you have to roll like uh, a, a 12 or so. It's uh, and then uh, your, your lower stuff is, you know, th- those are things you got to roll like maybe a seven or something like that. Yeah. Um, I've seen, I've seen a lot, I've seen lots of slap fights over the years regarding whether ascending or descending AC is better. Oh, I, I think that that's, that's the easiest answer in the world. Asc- uh, ascending is, uh, unabashedly better like there 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 are from what i understand people have tried to explain to me that there there are specific situations where where descending armor class actually has some kind of um some kind of benefit you know, that that's like basically uh, i i don't quite get it you know sometimes they'll say that basically having that that zero marker just makes it easier for people to uh, understand like understand exactly where they're at, you know, to have uh, an easier scale to understand, which I mean, I, I guess could make sense maybe, but I don't, I don't really buy it. Um, I, I, to me, Thacko, I mean, I, I did a video where I was teaching my wife who uh, has that, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's the numbers dyslexia, basically, you know, mm-hmm. um, she still was able to handle the, the matrix using the matrix and just, you know, doing the subtraction method with Thacko. Um, very quickly, like I taught her within like three minutes, and yeah. she had never looked at it before in her life. So, um, I it- I have always I've always um I've always I've always held the belief that it'll be easier for people to grasp aim high than aim low. Absolutely, yeah. And I'm I don't need and as easy as it would be to bring up to bring up um tape to bring up um other RPGs with this. I'd rather I'd rather bring I'd rather bring up something a little more old fashioned. Consider consider card games like wa- like War or or um to a cer- to a certain extent blackjack to a certain extent poker um some of the some of the some of the Parker Brothers style board games that we that we all played as kids mm-hmm. which were all in which were all centered around rolling high in some form or fashion some form yeah. of numbers go up and when you've had th- when you've had that kind of thing ingrained to the point to the point where um you c- i can i can make joke i can make jokes about who killed the cook in the billiard room and pe- and people will have some idea of what i'm talking about or the or the whole thing of do not pass go do not collect $200 that's it's one of those habits that yeah that you have to account for that is true yeah, and uh, video games, you know, because of uh, the the influence that they have on. I mean, that was my first exposure to, to the Dragon uh, Dungeons and Dragons license was through video games, you know. Uh, so, um, and, was it and through the SSI video games. No, no, I'm not that old school. <laughs> uh, no, uh, my first my first Dungeons and Dragons game was Neverwinter Nights, and. Good, good. Since game. then, I, I mean, I I went to Demon Stone, which was which was awesome, and I wish that they would have made uh, a sequel to that instead of doing the the reboot for Baldur's Gate. Not ba- no no not Baldur's Gate, um, Dark Alliance. Uh, but uh, the um, yeah, I, I also went back and tried out uh, Baldur's Gate one and two, which 
they're awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, if I could run P- uh, Baldur's Gate three, I would, but my PC sucks. So, um, have you tr- have you tried out Celasta? No, I haven't. Yeah, so Celasta is an is another entry that's trying to that's trying to replicate, um, more specifically D and D fifth edition's rules as close as possible. Um, hmm. Have you? I'd also rec- I'd also recommend looking into the classic that is Planescape Torment, if you haven't. Done yeah, that. yeah, I have I have that on PC, and um, then I also have the. Uh, I mean, it's not the same, but um, uh, Numenera. Um, Tides of well, Numenera. The, I, I get, you, you know what I'm talking Tides about. Tides of Numenera. Which, Tor- yeah, that's the one. That's the one. They're both they're both made by Numenera and Planescape. Were both were both the brainchild of Monty Cook. Um, back when back when he didn't have back when he during the brief during the two times where he didn't have a um ivory tower up his ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, he had he he had this system mastery at it attitude in the 2000s. That and mm-hmm. trying to throw all of the, sp- trying to throw in as many spells as he could, and giving nothing to people who weren't casters. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That that particular infamy is his is his fault. You would think that people would have been ready for a fourth edition martial classes at that point. <laughs> um, after after that kind of treatment, they 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 would be ready for, you know, something uh, a little I bit have, kinder. I have found it very amusing. How people seem to have a selective memory regarding certain me- certain um mecha- certain mechanical trends with um D and D over the years. Um, I remember back in two thousand, seeing jo- seeing um posts from people like John Wick. No, not that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, lamenting lamenting the changes with third edition and how it isn't D and D. And um, comparing D and saying that they were trying to turn D and D into Diablo, a bit ironic when there's an AD and D module about Diablo. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! Did I say that out loud? There are a couple, if I remember. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! There were there were there were quite a few for both Diablo one and two. A little mm-hmm. bit less with um with two, just because of ti- of timing, but they were yeah. there. Um. And. The, and um, the big the big argument that I, that I heard that I um I find I found laughable in 2008 and I find laughable to this day is the idea of the idea that they were trying to turn Dungeons and Dragons into a video game or more specifically into World of Warcraft, which as somebody who at one point played World of Warcraft fairly regularly. Until until they until they decided to until Blizzard decided to be Blizzard, um, I'd say, I'd I um fi- I find that to be a little too hyperbolic. Yeah, I think hyperbolic is probably a good word for it. Because uh, well, you know I wouldn't say that you know uh, no I'm gonna have to preface this with the big old like I've only skimmed fourth edition because I have the um. Uh, it's it's the rules reference compendium. It's not like the actual. Yeah, you know, if it's from if it's from that essentials run, that's not that's not exactly what I'd consider the best resource because essentials. Was oh, definitely. Ca- essentials was the canary in the coal mine for a certain pr- for certain problems that I would have later on with fifth. Um, oh, I see. But the but um when it came when it came to when it came to fo- when it came to um. This whole that whole turn turning it into wow, um, what that what that argument really told me is that the people making it had not pl- had not played World of Warcraft or possibly any MMO mm-hmm. because they I'd hear people bring up the whole thing of cl- of classes having to, classes having to find roles which has always more or less been the case you're not gonna you're not really gonna see fighters use any use anything but melee weapons 99% of the time um mm-hmm. for just for instance you're go, you're go, you're going to have a lot of the times you're going to have the cleric be the he, be the healing with some bits of off, offense but not really for, not really for attacking all that much um the thief is going to be doing thief things and 
the and the ma and the mage is going to be over and the mage is going to be um debatably overpowered in short bursts. <laughs> right, right. Um, I've never been a fan of the Van of the Vancian model for spell casting. I'll put that out. Uh, there. I love it. I love it, but I I understand why people don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but the reason why I brought up the the reason why I brought up the SSI computer games earlier was a bit of a demonstration of the fact that video games and D and D have a much closer relationship than people like to think. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, even going back, to, even going back to. A version of D and D that was played on the um, Play-Doh engines back in the seventies, which most people didn't know about because the Play-Doh servers were not exactly a widespread thing. Plus, well, it was the seventies. Oh, I thought I thought that was a joke. <laughs> but Play-Doh, you know. <laughs> no, play. I, it was an it was an acronym. P L A T O. Oh, okay. Okay. It was a very. Er, it was a. It could be considered a early ancestor of a of a lot of modern day computing. Hmm. Um, but that that's that's a story for another day. <laughs> but the big re if I'm being honest, the big reason why I'm not why I'm not a huge fan of um of Vancy and casting is a couple things. One, when you have a when you have a limited resource. You can invite the rainy day paradox. Or uh, the, that you never use it because you're saving it for a rainy day. Yeah, you're saving it for a rainy day that never comes. Yeah, yeah, I have done that. <laughs> you can have the opposite end of things where, once the bee bag shows up, the mage just throws every spell that they have at at it and ends and ends up wiping the thing out a little too early. Ah, see, to me, there is no such thing as too early with that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's, it's I, I am going no. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that doesn't really bother me so much as long as like the the game is still able to like as long as resources are still something that they end up having to manage. I'm okay with the uh, the Nova ing. You know, if they're managing things properly. Yeah. Uh, oh, but. I'd say one. I'd say one of the, uh, but one of the other issues is more of a more of a more of a somewhat setting issue, because the Vancean model is named that for Jack Vance, mm -hmm. the cre the creator of the Dying Earth series of books, which um, Gygax and Arneson happen to be fans of. Right. And in those kind of setups, the that's where you get the whole thing of um, ridiculously long names for. Sp for spells, <laughs> um, the idea that you have to memorize the idea that you have to commit spells to memory, and the like, which Terry Pratchett made fun of with the character of Rincewind in Discworld. But I've heard I need to read that. But the prop, but the problem is <clears throat> that particular those particular books have magic as this advanced form of math. And the and the and is a very sword and sorcery setup. It's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to do that. It's kind of hard to justify that approach, in my opinion, when you have a setting where magic is everywhere and always present. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean that 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 does. Yeah, so whenever you say it that way, I, I can kind of see why, um, especially for for fifth edition, it starts to feel like it's kind of going out the window. Um, you know, in my my first edition game, um, you know, magic is, I mean, it's there, but at the same time, uh, it's it's still it's still it, it's not quite Conan levels of of you know sword and sorcery, but at the same time, uh, it's definitely not you know the uh, the conception of forgotten realms that we have now with people having uh, magic on tap through through most of yeah. the day uh, I'm, I'm not you know. saying that i'm not saying that low ma that having low magic or high magic is better or worse my issue is to turn a phrase shit or get off the pot 
Yeah, yeah. I, I I see what you mean. Uh, you know, it it works for the, for the purposes of of what I try to do, you know, but that's the thing is whenever I'm playing 5th edition, I'm not really trying to uh, I'm not trying to capture Vancian so much, you know, like at that point it is it is pretty much gone. Um I don't know that I would want to like I don't I don't I really I don't know what I would want to do. like at, honestly at that point I would probably be <laughs> happier with uh with the uh you know encounter powers and stuff like that. I know I know that the uh the terminology is a, is a huge turnoff for a lot of people uh well, because it sounds so gamey, but It's a freak um they you know they you know they say they say that and yet they and yet they're using game terms and they're playing a game. Right, right. Um, yeah. That's <laughs> once once again the the big reason why I, why I keep picking on um grogs is be, is because of that um la that lack of perspective and when it comes to the in, when it comes to the encounter the um terminology like encounter power um how was the question that I end up having to ask is how is how is that any different than fe than features that that um say, that say you can cast this that can cast the the spell x amount of times per day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, turn undead is is a pretty famous encounter power. You know, you can only do it once per encounter. Um, that's uh, that's that's been that way for forever, as yeah. far as I know. Um, and yeah, we have daily powers. We've always had that. Uh, at at will is you know a little bit trickier like then you might be like well you know there's the ability for druids to be able to tell if this water is clean you know and that kind of thing not not really so much a lot of the uh the cantrip abilities that we're familiar with now but uh you know they, they, they've they've had a little something um you know it really doesn't it doesn't grind my gears as much as it does some people but i think a lot of it is the expectations are off you know uh, if we're doing the kind of game where we have those kinds of at will powers that you know the uh, the magical people are able to do, then yeah, you, you stop thinking in terms of of Jack Vance, you know, Tales of the Dying Earth, and you start thinking of uh, I don't I don't know so something else. <laughs> Which <laughs> like the pr the problem if if um if there were a more defined setting, I get the feeling that this that this wouldn't be as much of an issue. True and. I know. I know. People say that some people say that Greyhawk is supposed to be the the defined setting. Some people say Mistara is. Some people say um, Black Blackmore is, and and so on. But the fact that the fact that there's so many answers is the exact problem I'm hinting at here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, even even then. Um... You you could you could say well you could look at all the inspired reading but the inspired reading goes kind of all over the place um, you know into science fiction you know into Tolkien into uh, Vance um, you know I've been reading Three Hearts and Three Lions and you know you can see the inspirations you know pulled from this spot that spot uh, but th these are often in worlds that are even though they may have like similarity in genre, there's still a lot of difference in how they function. Well, consider consider some of the names that consider some of the big names that are on that inspiration list because everybody likes to throw Appendix N at me whenever I bring this kind of thing up. Um, almost almost like a get out of debate free card. <laughs> um, you have Morcock responsible for the for the Eternal Champion books and more specifically the Elric trilogy. Um, Robert E. Howard, who needs no introduction. Jack mm -hmm. Vance, who I've already talked about. Fritz Lieber, who's responsible for Fathford and the Grey Mauser, and I probably mispronounced his name. No, I think you got it. Um, Tolkien, who, again, needs no introduction. And when you look at the, when you look at that, those batch of authors, aside from them being fantasy authors, that's, they have nothing else in common. Yeah, that's that's true, and in a lot of cases, they uh, you know some of them were more science fictiony, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in in certain instances. You got then uh, you got your H.P. Lovecraft on there somewhere, and uh, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's on he's I'll, on there in there. Well, Ill, um, mind flayers. Need I say more? Yeah, yeah. But 
and there's and there's the fact that Howard and Lo Howard and Lovecraft were on friendly terms with each other. To to the at least at least to the point where they'd where they'd um swap no where they'd um talk where they'd be willing to talk shop with each other each other on some form. Mm -hmm. Um, probably probably united by a mute by a hatred of Hugo. I I don't know I don't know if um how, I don't know if Howard hated him, but I know Lovecraft did. He even called him Hugo the Rat. Now I'm I'm gonna collect some hate for this probably, but who who is Hugo? Um, Victor Hugo, the the man, one of the one of, um, not not Victor Hugo, um, Hugo Gernsback, the the per, the person whom the Hugo Award is named after. Oh, okay, okay. Um, he, a lot of it is hearsay, but he apparently had a reputation of, um, fucking with people's money. Hmm. Which. Is a good way is a good way to get on a lot of authors' bad side, especially pulp authors in the twenties. But uh, not not enough to uh, no longer have an award named after you. <laughs> I think a lot. I think a lot of a lot of the dirty laundry with him came came started coming out decades later. Mm hmm. So I think at I think at the time that award was set up, nobody really knew. Yeah. But. Um, I know, I know that you're you're currently you're currently going through those two campaigns for um eight for with um AD and D. But what what do you have planned down the pipe? Man, it's it's pretty crazy. I mean, I have I have a million different systems on my shelf. Um, right. So right now I've got two first edition games going on. I've got uh, two fifth edition games going on. I'm also doing. Uh, Lion and Dragon on um, Sundays, mm -hmm. which is uh, medieval role playing. Um, and uh, as far as future goes, sky's the limit. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, my Call of Cthulhu second edition um, Kickstarter thing that should be coming in sometime soon. Mm -hmm. Whenever the shipping container business is taken care of, um, I. Uh, I have a uh, 13th age, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't want to like just get, do more and more and more D and D derivatives, but um, at the same time, that is one that uh, because it's inspired by fourth edition and I have a curiosity for fourth edition without the desire to spend $150 on uh, rule books that I may only use once. <laughs> 13th <laughs> like, age is really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I, I've been really, I'm really interested in, in it. And I think that, a lot of the players that I've, I've played 5e with, I think that they would really enjoy um, what it has to offer just because it has the um, has the ability for them to, you know, do very cool things with their characters. It is very much a heroic um, adventure game. Uh, and it also has the, um, the kind of narrative backings that a lot of times they seem to crave, but I don't tend to provide them because I'm usually thinking more in terms of my sandboxy uh, D and D, um, I don't know. I, I guess bog standard approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I I wish you the I wish you the best of luck with when you get to that point. If you do, if you're if you're able to do, if you're able to do it, if you're able to get it get the stuff in a bundle, I would recommend getting. I would recommend getting both um, Thirteenth Age and Thirteen True Ways. Uh, okay. The the ideal trinity is is both of them and the bestiary. Um, mm -hmm. There's a de there's a decent amount of mo there's a decent amount of monsters and it's easy and it, it's easy to hack monsters into Thirteenth um, Age compared to some other games. Hmm. Um, but the the reason why I bring up Thirteen True Ways is some of the classes that it brings in. That's the that's like an expansion, isn't it? Yeah, it 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 brings in a handful of new classes. It brings in its particular rules for some for um summoning, and it do, and does a f and a few and a few other a few other knickknacks. Hmm. Um, okay. But the only the only other thing I'd I'd advise you to keep in mind is um 
your is have is have conversations regarding regarding um, character backgrounds and icon relationships when you get to thirteenth age. Because mm -hmm. that is that is something where um there's gonna there's gonna be there's gonna be the understanding that that um the pl that player and GM are gonna are gonna have to work are gonna have to work with that. Yeah. Especially since there isn't a backgrounds kind of replace skills. Mm -hmm. It's a bit it's a bit more broad, but it is it is still gonna be there. And icon you could consider icon to be the replacement for alignment, but it's more of faction allegiance. Yeah, and that's one of the things that really stuck out to me about it is, you know, I love I love faction play, but I don't tend to use it to the extent that I would like to. So I kinda like the idea that it's just baked into their the their character mechanically. I think that's an interesting approach. Yeah. Also the one unique thing. Which fortunately there's some advice in the core in the core book about what about what kind of one unique things might be pushing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, reading that section, uh, and it's it's cool. You know, I haven't uh, I haven't played Thirteenth Age yet, but I did play um, a game that uses uh, a rule very similar to that. Uh, it was uh, Crimson Dragon's Lair D twenty, and it uh, it had something similar like that. And whenever I made one of my characters, he had a a saw blade stuck in his head because it was a post apocalyptic uh, kind of thing. Yeah, and uh, you know, didn't really add any anything. Um, mechanically, you know, or anything like that. It just was kind of a an interesting little flair, you know. In worst case scenario, if I ever wanted to die in a cool way, I could just headbutt myself to death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just drive it in the rest of the way. Yeah. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my show and enjoy the madness at play here. And oh yeah, it's it's been a pleasure, man. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I, I've done a disservice for I've only been consuming water and Sprite, but uh, maybe I'll do better next time. Yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly see that. But, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>